Here's a question. Can you move without a gradient? Good morning. Happy Monday. I have NeuroCoffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. It's a little bit of a compressed week this week. Um, as, as we all know, um, but we'll figure something out. Um, we will be doing the Coffee and Coaches Conference call on Thursday morning, 6 a.m. Eastern time for all, the, all of you playing the, the home game. So don't miss out on that. Um, but let's go ahead and dig into uh, Monday's Q&A. And this is from Brian. And Brian says, Bill, I was reviewing some of your videos this week. So thank you, Brian, for reviewing those videos. He says, I came across your video titled When Stretching Works and When It Fails. Would it be fair to say that the concentric on concentric orientation you discussed is what causes bones to eventually approximate due to arthritic changes. I understand that under normal ideal circumstances, bones never touch. You are correct, sir. That is, that is accurate. Um, it seems that all range of motion is solely dependent on the ability to create a fluid gradient in one's joints, which is influenced by concentric and eccentric muscle orientations around the joints. Is that a fair statement to make or is there more to the big picture? Brian, I love the way you're thinking. Um, you are absolutely correct that we must have a gradient um, to, to exist, to allow movement to occur. In fact, this is an absolute universal principle um, under every circumstance. So, so in the physical world, nothing moves without, without a gradient. So a gradient is, is merely, in its simplest terms, a difference. And so gravity uh, is representative of an energy gradient. Um, electrical charge moves on a gradient. The solutes that move in and out of a cell move on gradient. So everything requires a gradient to move. But it would probably behoove us to do a quickie review of the whole concept of um, bones don't touch for those folks that haven't watched that video yet, right there. Maybe want to go watch that after we get done here. Um, so. We want to talk about the mechanisms of, of, that, the, that keeps bones apart. So first and foremost, we want to talk about the, the water behavior. So the synovial fluid in the joint is, is mostly water. It's got some protein stuff that, that floats around in it. But water behaves very specifically when it's approximated um, to different surfaces. So the hyaline cartilage that aligns the, the joints is very hydrophilic. So it likes water. And when water's up against it, the water separates into positively and negatively charged water. And that positively charged water stays right through the middle of the joint because the, the negative would approximate to, to the hyaline cartilage. And so then, now what we have is a, an electromagnetic force that, that actually keeps the, the, the joint apart. So these positive charges repel one another. And, and it's just like trying to bring two north poles of magnets together. You get that repulsive force, so it pushes the joint apart. It also makes the synovial fluid in that middle very, very slippery, which is kind of good. So it keeps the joints from squeaking, just like the motor oil in your, in your car engine. So again, very, very useful on, on multiple levels. We also have connective tissue behaviors that, that surround the joint. So um, if we were talking about, say, a knee joint, um, if you look at the connective tissue, we've got connective tissues that are going all sort of which ways, but, but there's, a, there's a, a strong horizontal element to that. And so when we compress the knee joint, so we put weight on the knee joint, that connective tissue becomes very, very stiff. So it's loaded very, very quickly. So this is actually the of overcoming action that we talk about in the connective tissues when we're talking about any kind of movement. And so that makes the knee joint very, very stiff. And so it compresses the fluid inside the joint. And so now we have an external compression that actually pushes those bones apart. And so um, we need all of these mechanisms to be intact. So we have this nice, nice, healthy knee joint. But we also need to be able to shift this fluid around to have normal movement. So as you stated um, in the concentric on concentric orientation, so we've, let's just say that we only have two sides of a knee joint here. If we have concentric on one side, concentric on the other side, we have a resultant pressure that is straight through the joint. So we have this, this compressive uh, um, strategy throughout the joint. The problem here is, is this, this hyaline cartilage that creates our electromagnetic element uh, of, our, of our protection, if you will, um, against the, the bones touching is, is going to be affected by this. So the, the nutrition that supplies this hyaline cartilage comes from the subchondral bone. And so if I put enough pressure on the subchondral bone over a long enough period of time, I'm gonna reduce the ability of the nutrients to, to diffuse against a great, uh, with a gradient rather, 
the, to diffuse from the bloodstream to the hyaline cartilage. And then so what we eventually get is a breakdown of this hyaline cartilage from the bony side. And so if this cartilage breaks down, I lose my electromagnetic capabilities. I can no longer keep the joints separated. And so now I have this high potential that I'm going to develop some form of arthritic condition as this hyaline cartilage starts to break down. Now, that's concentric on concentric. So, so I think you're correct, Brian, that, that this is a mechanism. But now I want you to think about a specific circumstance. So let's talk about, let's just say somebody with a, with a narrow ISA. So here's what we know about those folks with narrow ISA that have limited breathing excursion, is that I have an inhalation biased axial skeleton with a compensatory exhalation strategy. And what that does, Brian, is it's gonna bias towards external rotation um, throughout the, the peripheral joints. And so under this circumstance, what I have is a concentric bias on one side, eccentric bias on the other, which is a gradient that's gonna move our joint in a direction. But if I cannot concentrically orient the eccentric musculature or eccentrically orient that concentric musculature, I no longer have the, the fluid shift that is required for me to move this joint effectively. Now I have the same concept that I had with the concentric on concentric. I just have it more localized to one aspect of the joint. So this might be why you see in a knee, you see the medial compartment um, tend to break down a little bit quicker than everything else, or you'll see the posterior shoulder break down a little bit quicker uh, than the rest. Now, I also want you to understand the circumstance that this is gonna affect all of your connective tissues. So anytime I put a prolonged pressure or tension on these connective tissues, I'm gonna see the same progressive degeneration because I'm reducing blood flow, I'm reducing the, the nutrients that are getting to those tissues. So this might be why we see the degenerative changes in, in tendons over time, um, in addition to the arthritic changes. So I want you to keep that in mind as well, Brian. Brian, this is a great question. For those of you that, that are interested, um, go watch the uh, uh, Bones Don't Touch and Joints Aren't Levers video. And then also the uh, When Stretching Works and When It Fails video will also talk about these concepts as well. So I would refer you to those. If you have any further questions or comments, please send them to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. And I will see you tomorrow.